Welcome to the video. In this video, we're going to go through and do the very basic setup on our Pixhawk 2.1. Now, in the last video, we talked about the fact that Ardu Plane 3.8 was out and that quite a few things had changed. So the overview that we're about to go through here, treat it as kind of a summary. There's lots of detail in exactly the steps to go through in the documentation. I'll put a link in the description for you to go through that. So use this as a guide, but because each of the steps has so many things potentially that you need to do. I'm going to focus more on the gotchas for each of the step and then hopefully you can just follow along and get to the other end and it'll work okay. The idea is at the end of this video we'll be in a position where we can actually go out and do a quick little test flight and that will be in the next video and then we can go on from there. So the first thing I'm going to do is let me power up the plane. Now I'm actually recording this sat with the plane by the side of me on the desk and uh, that does mean that the audio levels in this piece are going to uh, go up and down as I move away from the microphone. So just bear with me while I turn on and power up the plane. I'm just going to plug the battery in. Power up the Tyrannus Radio 2. Here we go, that's all linked up. And now plug the USB cable into the computer. And now we should be able to connect. Now what we're going to do is as soon as we are on here, let's start at the very beginning uh, about how we actually flash all of the software. Now to flash uh, the software what you need to do make sure you're unconnected go into initial setup go to install firmware it'll come up with all the firmware versions we've installed Ardu Plane 3.8. Now the thing with Ardu Plane uh, you have to be careful of if you have a previous version on there like Ardu Plane 3.7.x I would recommend installing something like APM Rover first, deleting the contents of the SD card, and then installing Ardu Plane 3.8. The reason for that is that the uh, the upgrade seems to make a couple of mistakes occasionally, and um, part of the reason I think I got in a bit of a pickle was because I tried to install Ardu Plane over the top of Ardu Pilot 3.7.x, and it picked up some of the parameters and did its best to interpret them but uh, that wasn't ideal. So if you've already played with the previous version, I'd recommend blow it away with APM Rover first and then flash Ardu Plane. If this is a brand new installation, just go straight for Ardu Plane 3.8 or whatever version it's currently on as you're watching this video. Other trick I'd say is that the majority of USB connections on a computer won't have enough current to run the Pixhawk and all the connected electronics as well. So in that case, you will need to power it from the battery. I struggled a little bit with that and the way I got it to flash because the idea is is you you click on Ardu plane you say you want to upload it and then it tells you to unplug and replug the Pixhawk in and that gets into bootloader mode the trick there is when you unplug the USB cable also unplug the battery then re-plug in the USB cable. It won't power the Pixhawk up. It'll just make a ticking noise if your USB port hasn't got enough current to supply it. Then plug the battery in as quickly as you can and then it should come up in bootloader mode and flash OK. So that's the trick there. Then once you've got all that and it'll tell you to wait for all the beeps to finish and once all the beeping's finished and it's gone quiet then you can connect to the machine. And what we're going to do is go through all of the settings and again I'm going to talk about more of the gotchas really than anything else. Now the nice thing here is that we have this stuff called mandatory hardware. Uh, this is all the stuff that you need to go through to make sure that you have the basics set to be ready to go out and fly. You can click on the wizard and the wizard will take you through each of the individual steps. The wizard is going to assume that you have your radio set up, that all the parameters and everything's in the right order. I like going through it in this way, just to make sure that if I have a bit of a problem, I can just stop it, go and make a correction and fix it as well. So we're just going to go through each of these in turn. First one you'll do is accelerometer calibration. At the top here, when you calibrate the accelerometer, each time you click it, you'll have to put the plane in another attitude. The first is going to be level, then on its left-hand side, right-hand side, nose down, nose up, and on its back. 
Once you finish the accelerometer calibration, go into flight data and have a look at that artificial horizon. Move the plane around and make sure that the artificial horizon is moving properly. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly at 90 degrees. The trick here is to make sure that the plane is nice and still and not wobbling around so that the calibration works perfectly. Next thing to do is calibrate level. This is, it might be something we have to come back and do again. Put the plane as though it's in flight and then click calibrate level. So mine's more or less there. Let's just click calibrate level and that should work okay. This has completed. Once you've done those two steps, go into compass calibration. First thing we need to do is tell it which flight controller we're using. We're obviously using the Pixhawk. So we'll just click on that. It'll give us a warning about the versions. Just click yes and then we can click on live calibration. Now, when we're clicking on live calibration, what you then have to do is you move the plane in all three axes. So this is another thing where you need a nice long USB cable and lots of space. Ideally, you want to be doing this outside, away from lots of magnetic interference from things like magnets and also lots of metal too. I'd recommend doing this every two or three months and again once it's all finished go back onto the flight data screen and the orientation and the direction of the plane should match exactly what you've got. Once you've done that then next thing is radio calibration. Now the way this should work is as you increase the throttle you should see the throttle rise and as you decrease the throttle, you should see it drop. As you push the yaw stick to the left, you should see it go to the left. And as you push the yaw stick to the right, or the rudder stick, it should go to the right. And similarly with the aileron, if you move the aileron stick to the left, it should roll should go down. And if you move it, the aileron stick to the right, the roll should go up. The only difference is with the pitch control. If you push the elevator up, ideally, pitch should go down. If it doesn't, click on the reverse button here or reverse the channel in the radio. It's one of those weird things that's always been like this and we've talked about it in every APM and Pixhawk series that we've done. If you do it that way around, then hopefully everything should start to work. The other thing I've done here is I've also got the three position switch for my flight modes on channel launch. 8. Fly -by -wire a. Mode. That's just the audio announcements that I've already put onto the radio and uh, what you do is you click calibrate radio it'll tell you to move the sticks into all the corners and or then to put them in the middle position. One of the things I will say is on something like a Tyrannus which I'm using here the Tyrannus typically likes to push the PWM value because that's what that number is here and ideally you want them as close to 1500 as you possibly can. Uh, so for example, that pitch, uh, which is the elevator, looks a bit big. So go into your subtrim menu, select the subtrim value, and change it until it goes down to 1500. If it isn't 1500, then the Pixhawk will read it as you're trying to fly in that particular direction. So just spend a bit of time, go through, reset all of your trims. Also make sure that the Tyrannus isn't overdriving it. So if you go above 2000 or below 1000, when you're moving from side to side, then uh, fix that too. Any problems at all, once you change anything like that, always recalibrate your radio and you should be fine. Next thing to do then is ESC calibration. I'm not going to cover that yet. We're going to do that in the next video because everything I'm doing here, the prop is off the plane and that's really important. Make sure that if you're going to be powering it with a battery, you're going to be playing with things on the radio that you don't change any of that. Flight modes. Now, if I move my flight mode switch, you can see it moving around. Now I'm going to select two or three of these. And so the way it works is that as I move the switch, the mode switch, you can see it moving into the different position. I'm only going to set up a couple of settings for the initial test flight. I want a manual mode, which is that one there. That gives me the ability to see exactly how the control surfaces are moving without the Pix hook doing anything. It's just going to pass the value straight through to the servos. It'll just do the mixing for the V-tail that I have here. And also I'm going to select fly by wire A because that will put it into stabilized mode and I can just double check that that's all working too. Stabilize mode. Last thing to do 
is check your fail safe and we talked about fail safe already quite a bit. Again, we'll cover this in a little bit more detail in the next video. There's a ton of information about this in the Ardu Copter bits and pieces. What you can do is you can set it and bind your radio with a very low throttle PWM value. If we go back to the radio very quickly, you can see here that the lowest throttle I'm going to experience is about 1004, 1005. What you can do is reduce that on the radio, rebind the receiver, so that's something like 930, and then uh, set it back to normal on the radio. But that means then if I lose connection with the Pixhawk, then if uh, I set it something like 950 and I'm using throttle failsafe, then once the connection's lost and the radio receiver puts out that kind of 930 value, then it'll know that there's a problem. It's not a particularly elegant solution and the Pix hook. I actually like the way things like the Vector does it with SBUS, but that will work for now. But we'll come back and we'll test that all in the next video. Once we've done that, the last thing to do then is to kind of check the things that we looked at in the previous video. That, that all the control surfaces are moving in the manual setting. So what you need to do is make sure that you do have those two flight modes, both manual and fly by wire A selected, put it into manual mode, move the sticks on the radio and watch what's happening on your model. Now the servos won't move on a Pixhawk 2.1 until you've pressed and held the little button that's part of the GPS puck. Because what happens there is that's uh, the arming button, you press and hold that and then suddenly all the servos will burst to life. So press and hold it and then use the manual mode and move the control sticks on your radio to make sure that everything's moving okay. If anything is moving the wrong way round, just click the reverse button on here and uh, make sure that that's all okay. If the input and the radio calibration isn't done, it can create problems later on and become a bit of a compound effect, and that's what we were talking about in the last video. The next thing you need to do, the final thing here, is just to do the config and tuning. Now, if we look at the standard parameters, here are all of the parameters that we've got, loads and loads and loads. Now, there's full list and description of everything. I do like the way that actually has the description in here of how it all works. Now, we need to set up servos connected to outputs two and four in the Pixhawk to be a V-tail, and this is how we do it. It's not particularly elegant in Mission Planner, but isn't too tricky. So if we just find servo 2, which is the output we're interested in, we get the four outputs. So the first thing we can do is select the output function on servo 2. There's an awful lot to choose from, depending on what we've got, whether it's spoilerons, flapperons, you name it. Now we obviously want it on VTEL right for servo 2. We can set the minimum and maximum deflection. So in here is where we would play with how far uh, it's going to move so it isn't overdriven. We can decide whether or not it's normal or reversed. And we can also, using this slider, make sure that the servo is exactly at 90 degrees and that the control surface is all set up beautifully. So that's servo 2, which is VTEL right. The other one that we're going to need to set up is also servo 4. And servo 4 is my VTEL left. Again, very similar kind of settings. If any of the stabilized controls feel like they're moving in the wrong way, then make a note of which one it is and come here and reverse them. It's a little bit of an iterative process. Again, in the previous video, I talked about how to tackle that if you find that all the stabilization stuff is in the right direction, but the manual control isn't or vice versa. You have to go through it a little bit and you might end up actually reversing the channel on your radio, but eventually you'll get it set. The way it should work when it's all perfect is in manual mode, the control surfaces will work exactly as you'd expect on a plane without a Pixhawk, but if you put it in a stabilized mode like fly-by-wire A, it should move the control surfaces to try and arrest the uncommanded movement. So if you roll, tilt, or you're the model, you should see all the control surfaces trying to stop that from happening. So now we've got to the end of that we are getting pretty close. So in the next video, let's just spend a little bit more time mooching around with failsafe, because that's such an important part of making sure the plane is safe to maiden. And then we'll do our final checks and we'll take it out to the field 
and give it a first fly before we get on to some of the much more sophisticated things that this flight controller can do. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video and particularly for watching right to the very end. We try and release a video on Tuesday and Friday and sometimes we'll release one or two extra ones in a week as well. All of the videos on the channel are organised into easy to use playlists so do have a look in there because if you're interested in a subject we organise all the videos on that subject so you can find them easily all together in one place. If you like what we're doing, then please like and subscribe and tell others about the channel so they can come and join as well. We're available in all of the usual social media places, particularly in places like Instagram, Twitter, and we also share all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse.